Uh, please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, who is sufficient for these things, Father, I pray that you would grant grace to all in attendance today. Father, we are a small group, you know this, but Lord, we know that your word says when two or three are gathered, there you are in the midst of them. Father, we ask that you would attend this word today. We all need your help, including the man trying to preach your word this morning. Father, we ask for grace, great grace, this day, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I started working on a message. It was the dependence that we have on the Holy Spirit. And I was, the message started, I started forming, and then it started changing, and then all of a sudden the Lord pulled me off of it all together. I am often leery of preaching Christmas messages because of the questionable nature of the holiday. I am aware of what tomorrow is and what it represents. I am also aware that there are good Christians who do not celebrate this holiday for a variety of reasons. The last church that I had the privilege of being a member at was about split. Half of the people celebrated, the other half didn't. I, when I think, when I thought back on this, I thought it's really that is the importance of having a church body. It's not so that we all agree on every single doctrinal position. It's so that you can grow. This is how, this is what Paul writes about when he's writing to the church. It puts into practice what you see in scripture. And while I don't see a problem with celebrating the birth of Christ, I do understand those who see a, an issue with it. Well, you may, and I think everybody here celebrates Christmas. If you don't, don't feel isolated. We won't judge you here, I don't think. I won't. And I have Romans 14 to tell you why I won't judge you. And if you celebrate in a church of people who predominantly don't celebrate, if you end up in the future in a church like that, they shouldn't judge you either. Again, refer to Romans 14. But in all things, always remember that there is an enemy of your soul. And he would love nothing more than for us to get into this city about this holiday, or anything really. He wants a reason for you to have something against your brother or sister. And we would be foolish to think that because this is a high holy day that Satan is not still roaming about, seeking whom he may devour. Christmas is not off limits. I had the opportunity to preach last year. For some reason, preachers don't like preaching around these days. But it was last year was actually Christmas Day. And again, in that environment, you stand up and you can feel the tension because I want to go there, but I know it would be an offense to others. So you have to really be careful. And you can feel that tension. And if you slip up, then that gives an opportunity for Satan to create some conflict. My thought on Christmas or Easter or any high holy day is it is what you make of it. If you make an idol of Christmas, it is idolatry. If you make an idol of Easter, it is idolatry. The same goes for any holiday. But I think it would be profitable for us today to look at the history of the holiday of Christmas. Again, if you have heard me preach, and I'm not sure how many times I've done it here, maybe three, four? This is three. Three, this is the third time you've heard me say this. My fear is that the world enters the church. What goes on out there shouldn't necessarily happen in here all the time. Some would argue that 
if you are standing up there talking about Christmas, you've willingly brought the world into the church. I don't necessarily agree with that fully. But I do always err on the side of caution. If there is an area of non-clarity or an area of a gray area is what they call it, then I always err on the side of, of caution. I'll go into some reasons here in a bit. Keep an open mind. I'm not trying to tell you to celebrate a holiday or not celebrate it. I'm just going to give you some facts here. Christmas is established to be the day that Jesus Christ was born. This is to be a celebration of Christ. In scripture, there is no definite date given to substantiate anything concrete or season. Any arguments that I've researched on this topic is merely speculation. Many believe that it is between the months of December and January. In the Greek and Russian Orthodox churches, Christmas is celebrated 13 days after the 25th, also referred to as the Epiphany or Three, King, Three Kings Day. This is the day that they believe in scripture when the three wise men found Jesus in the manger. Others believe it was in the months of April or September, sometime around there. If I start going through their scriptural references, we'll be here until Christmas. <laughs> the issue that many Christians have with the holiday is the history of it. <clears throat> At the end of every year, historically, there is some type of celebration. Early Europeans celebrated light and birth in the darkest days of winter. Without going into a whole bunch of details, this winter festival of celebration was called the Winter Solstice. In Scandinavia, the Norse celebrated Yule on December 21st through January sort of a, a variation of the winter solstice. You may, Yule may sound familiar to you. Um, Yuletide carols. Yuletide is the worship of the wild hunt, the god Odin. Many Americans have no idea what that means. You may have heard, again, Yuletide carols. The word Yuletide is now, it, it has changed over time, and now it is Christmas tide. You probably never heard that word. I didn't until I started doing research. Moving forward through history, we come to the Roman Empire and the holiday known as Saturnalia. Saturnalia was a month-long celebration during the time of winter solstice. And in, during this time period, there's another celebration of Mithra, celebrated by the richer Romans. Mithra is the god of the unconquerable sun. The date of this celebration was December 25th. In the early church, there was no celebration of Christ's birth. In the fourth century, Pope Julius I chose the same date of the uh, Mithra, of the celebration of Mithra of December 25th as the date that would become known as Christmas. At this time, or maybe even before the fourth century, the pagan traditions started to die. The pagan religion started to fade. But many of the celebrations still existed. Oh, so basically what happened is the Pope decided we're going to keep these dates and we're just going to throw a Christmas on top of it or, or a Christian celebration. And when I say Christian, I'm speaking Christendom at large. We obviously wouldn't agree with the Pope on many things. Hence the rub you can see with many Christians, especially ones who are saved out of Catholicism. You don't want anything to do with the Pope or Catholicism. The Puritans denied the legitimacy of the holiday because there is no 
mention of a specific date, like I mentioned earlier, nor is there any command given in Scripture to celebrate the birth of Christ. I say all that to just give you a history of the holiday of Christmas so that you better understand why, where people are coming from when they, they want nothing to do with it. They kind of hiss and gnash their teeth at it. They don't like it. While I do celebrate, and many of you, I do want us to understand the facts. This holiday has very little scriptural backing. It is not commanded, and its origins may not even be Christian. All of that being said, here's the reason why I celebrate. There's nothing in this day and age that is Christian, righteous, in a righteous manner, biblical manner. And Christmas has become so widely accepted that it's difficult for anything to sustain holiness when it's become so large. The idea of something being largely accepted usually means that people are going to take liberties with it. For example, the Puritans loved Thanksgiving. If they saw what Thanksgiving is now, they would probably be horrified. Black Friday has pushed so far back into Thanksgiving that it's like a week-long shopping spree now. You can never look to the world for guidance on celebrating anything. What cannot be denied about this season is the worship offered to Jesus Christ. And most of it probably done unintentionally. You can walk through the grocery store and, and hear a, a, a Christmas song and what they're doing, what they're saying is they're giving glory to Christ. Mm -hmm. This cannot be denied. Even secular musicians, if they paid attention to the lyrics, they might be saved thereby. However this holiday may have started, the ending of it is glory to Christ. Joseph, when speaking to his brothers who sold him into slavery in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20, says, But for you ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. While this holiday at this point is, is tradition, it's, it's how you were raised. If you were raised celebrating Christmas, you probably still do. If you weren't, you probably don't. If you, again, were saved out of Catholicism, you probably want nothing to do with it. I still celebrate it as the birth of Christ because there is no other time when it is really even celebrated. Detractors will say to you, well, you can celebrate the birth of Christ at any time. But the, the, the fact is you won't. I, I told you earlier I was working on a message about the Holy Spirit. The fact is, our theology sometimes gets in the way. It, it, it becomes a problem. Our doctrine kind of hurts us sometimes. And I'm talking about, I'm not talking about broad Christianity right now. I'm talking about sovereign grace folks. Baptists. We go so far the other way that we start to deny God's attributes. So we don't like to talk about the love of God or the Holy Spirit because we are afraid of being called a charismatic. We don't speak about the birth of Christ out of fear of being labeled a Catholic. And we're in error on these things if this is our view. If you don't like the word Christmas, don't say it. The title of this message is The Birth of the Savior. The origin of the, Christ, the Christmas holiday, I think, has tainted the birth of our Lord. As we will see today, this is a foundational part of Christianity. If you will turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. And buckle up, because we're going to read a lot of scripture. We'll read the first 33 verses of <coughs> Luke chapter 2. And then we'll turn, so you can mark in your Bibles, we'll turn to Isaiah 53 right after that. 
And it came to pass in those days, Luke chapter 2 and verse 1, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that the world should be taxed. And this taxing was the first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she uh, brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. And there were in the same country shepherds aiding in their field, keeping watch over their, over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the Lord and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there, were, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And they, and they had seen it, and when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told to them concerning the child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all of these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every man that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer sacrifice according to that which the law of the Lord, which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the holy temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him the custom, do for him after the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of by him. Isaiah 53. We'll just read the first five verses here. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before them as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form, no, no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. 
he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. I think it is important to read what the Word of God says about the birth of Jesus. While there are many celebrating Christmas as the birth of Christ, many deny the specific aspects of some of the things we just read. I personally love, I would have been fine if the pastor would have said, you ain't just going to read every um, account of Christ's birth. That would have been good for me. And the prophecies. I mean, it's, it's, it's really rich. And it is the culmination of Old Testament scripture being fulfilled in the New Testament. Scripture testifying of scripture. In Luke chapter 2 and verses 1 through 6, we see that the birthplace of Christ was established. It is in Bethlehem. And verse 4, and Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. This fulfills the prophecy of Micah. And Micah 5 and verse 2, it says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little <coughs> among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth has been from of old, from everlasting. Now, you hear in scripture people refer to Jesus as Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth is where Jesus was raised, but he was born, as we just saw, in Bethlehem to fulfill scripture. What we have is this great privilege to read God's providence here. And maybe not take this for granted, this is a huge deal. This is a big deal. If you were living back in Jesus' day, you didn't have a complete record. You didn't know all the behind the scenes that, that we have. We see God ordering events to validate those things which were prophesied in the Old Testament. And it should be encouraging to every believer here today. We don't always know what God is doing. We don't always know the road ahead. We don't always know the scriptures perfectly the way we should. But we know that God knows all things and we can trust him. I'm sure Mary and Joseph didn't understand everything that was going on. But they listened. They understood enough to say we're going to do what God told us to do. And sometimes it's that simple. Sometimes we get spun up thinking, you know, can you imagine the trouble that Mary and Joseph would have got in if the angel came and started laying things out and they said, hmm, let me bust out my theology book and let me figure out if what you're saying, they probably would have gotten a lot of trouble. They didn't do that. They did exactly what God said, and they let God work things out the way that God wanted them to be worked out. According to Scripture, that's how God was working them out. Maybe they knew that, maybe they didn't. They didn't theologically dissect everything that the angel of the Lord told them. While we don't always know what God is doing, just being faithful to what God says creates blessings. Verse 5 mentions Mary, who was pregnant with the Savior. Mary was not yet married. Say that three times fast. But she was planning to be married to Joseph. At this point, Joseph and Mary did not have a physical relationship. Later, we know that they did. Because it is uh, Jesus' half-brothers and sisters are spoken of in Scripture if you can call them that. There is a group of Christians 
that deny, they accept Christmas, but they deny the virgin birth of Christ. There is also a group that will tell you that Mary was a perpetual virgin, that she had no other children. Well, then, who are these half-brothers and sisters of Jesus? People that would argue and say that those were his cousins. Similar to what we saw with the actual birthplace of Jesus, this is scripturally significant. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 prophesies of the virgin birth of Jesus. Not only is this significant prophetically, but the virgin birth has life or death consequences, if not true. Please turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and verses 12 through 19. It's going to sound strange in the King James. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all sin. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so is the free gift. For if through the offense one... Uh, for if the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, which much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in one, in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, one shall be, um, many shall be righteous. Easy for me to say. These verses clearly spell out our need for a Savior. We all are descendants of Adam. Regardless of your race or where you were born or your circumstances, we are all descendants of Adam. Thus, we all have Adam's curse. We are all prone to sin, those who are born normally. By one man did sin into the world, Paul says. There was only one man born of a virgin. It is the man Christ Jesus, the obedient man spoken of at the end of Romans 5 and verse 19. It is not only important, the virgin birth, to preserve prophecy, but because of Christ, the free gift was given. Because Christ was not born the same way we were, he was not bound by the curse that would have been imputed to Joseph. As righteous as Joseph may have been, he was still a descendant of Adam. We saw in Luke, well, we see in Luke chapter 1, we didn't read it, that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, comes upon Mary. She was really pregnant. Jesus was really formed in her womb. We saw that she was extremely pregnant and about to give birth in chapter um, 2 of Luke and verse 5. Mm -hmm. says she was great with child. Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man. You see, if Jesus was born exactly the way we are, then we are all in trouble. 
The curse of Adam still rests on Jesus if he was born through sexual relationship like we were. But he wasn't. A perfect, spotless sacrifice was needed to cover our sins. Jesus would not have been spotless. First of all, this, this, it has more implications than just physical relationship. Think about what you're saying if you're saying that Mary and Joseph had a physical relationship. They weren't married. It says that they were a spouse. They were planning to be married. So if you say that Mary and <coughs> Joseph had a physical relationship and Mary was not a virgin, then you are saying that Jesus was conceived then in sin. Uh, there's a thought out there that, well, God had a relationship, a physical relationship with Mary. Again, unless she is married to God, the implications are staggering. You have to either take the word for what it says or explain all of these. How do you explain out of that? The virgin birth signifies the uniqueness of Jesus Christ the miraculous nature of Christ. I think we can safely conclude that we will take the word of God as it is written and say that Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. Just one more point from Luke's account. There is a large contingent of people who offer undo worship to Mary. Again, this is a group very accepting of the holiday. The perpetual virginity of Mary is one way that they try to deify Mary, to make her a god. Mary, it is said in Luke chapter 1, is blessed among women. This is not because of what something that Mary did is because of what she was chosen to carry. She was chosen to be the carrier of the Savior, of the Savior to bear Jesus Christ. She did not impregnate herself. The Holy Ghost did that. However, Mary is forever tied to the immaculate conception of Jesus. And it is to be honored for being chosen. But do not fall into the trap of worshiping Mary. The canon of scripture that we have makes very little mention of Mary. While she is instrumental, I'm sorry, if she was instrumental, as some believe, I'm sure that the Holy Spirit would have moved somebody to write something to help us out. Paul makes no mention. I'm sure he would have pointed this out. Or some other apostle would have been led to write something more of Mary. But there is no command given to worship Mary. Jesus himself at times offers a rebuke to Mary in John chapter 2 and verse 4. This is a debated text among Catholics and Protestants. My take on John chapter 2 and verse 4 is that Jesus never ever misspoke. I believe that Jesus was absolutely positively sure of what he was saying to Mary. He knew what Mary would go on to represent. And Honestly, you don't need that verse to properly tell that story. It could have been left out, but the Holy Spirit led that to be added, almost as if to say, hey, no, don't do it. Mary is not to be worshipped. I say all of that, I give you those three examples of 
people who accept Christmas and then deny certain aspects so that we can be very careful. Good intentioned men make much of something that they shouldn't. Mary is not the object of worship. No more than you would thank the FedEx man for delivering your piano or something else. Now, that's not to belittle childbirth, which is a big deal. But you never go to the man delivering the package and say, sir, you have crafted an, an amazing package. And he's looking at you like, I didn't make that. Sony made that. Or somebody else made that. You are offering up worship to the wrong person. She was the carrier. And I'm not saying now, in another sense, you do thank the, per the postman. I do. I say thank you for delivering my package. This is the worship for Mary. She is blessed among women. Absolutely. She carried the Lord Jesus Christ. But she didn't do anything special. If you were a mother here, you gave birth. Not to Jesus Christ, but you gave birth the same way she did. But what you do if you worship Mary in this season is you offer that worship that belongs to God, to Jesus Christ, and you offer it to the deliverer of the package. So we have to be careful. God gives us an attribute of himself. He says, I am a jealous God. He doesn't like to share his, uh, his glory with others, so we have to be very careful. Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem and the world was never the same. But what I want to point out to you this morning, and I hope that you will take this with you, is that the story didn't end at Jesus Christ's birth. I really appreciate the songs we were singing this morning. His robes for mine and those types of songs. Because it's not just that the Lord was born and that was the end. He lived a perfect life. Some people are so enamored with the Christmas story because it's just cute baby Jesus in a manger. A baby can be controlled and maintained. Babies don't hold people accountable. Baby Jesus won't judge anyone. It's just a cute story of fantasy and legend. We read the prophecy of Isaiah, where Jesus Christ is described as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. No form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He was born in poverty. The king of all the earth. I think I was reading a newsletter from Papua New Guinea and some of the struggles that they have in childbirth just because of the lifestyle. And I'm not equating that to the birth of Christ at all. But those babies are not little babies that you go see at the hospital and you want to pick them up and you want to, you want to hug them and you want to say, oh, how, how cute this baby is. Isaiah says there's no form of comeliness. He came perfect, born of a virgin, exactly where he was supposed to be, exactly when he was supposed to be, and we esteemed him not. And we're not esteeming him now. This holiday doesn't change it, by and large. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. We despised him, and none of us were born saved, so there was always a point where we despised him. This baby born of a virgin would go on to die for our sins, to correct what was broken by Adam. To save many, we read in Romans chapter 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes are we healed. 
this baby would go on to be punished. Don't sell the birth of Christ short as many are going to do tomorrow. Go all the way. Many people like the cutesy details of Christ's birth, the neat songs, but Jesus came on a mission. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. John 6 and verse 38. But while we read in the book of Isaiah that there is nothing attractive to the masses about Jesus and Luke's account, there were some who worshipped Jesus. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. If you need salvation, you see Christ as beautiful, glorious, the King of Kings. This wasn't the groundswell that you would think of when you see the birth of a king. I watched, I can't think of what it's called. It's in England when they have the king, I don't know what it's called. Coronation, something like that. And thousands of people, and they line the streets and signs and clapping and cheering. That's not what you see here. But if you are saved today, Jesus is glorious to you. That's not what the religious elite of that day expected. They thought that when the Savior was born, they were going to kick the Romans out of there. That's not what they got. What they got was freedom. We just sang it. From sin, from the bondage of sin. There are, there is an account, and in my opinion, this is the strongest argument from scripture that can be made for celebrating the birth of Christ is that you see people doing it in Luke chapter 2. If you are outside of Christ today, this is the very reason why he came, why he was born. So that you can be reconciled to God. Not necessarily so you can have gifts. I tell my kids this every year. It's not so that we can put gifts under the tree and you can open gifts. The greatest gift that was given, Israel the, by and large missed it, is freedom from the bondage of sin. If there were no Christ, there would be no season, no reason to do this. There will be no Christmas. There will be many worshiping Christ. There are many Christmas messages I've seen past all the churches and I've seen the signs. But if you celebrate the holiday, do it faithfully. Tell the whole story. And if you need to, and we've had to do this, you can be silent. You don't have to put on the, the necklace that with the lights on it and tell everybody that I celebrate Christmas. For the preservation of peace, you can you can you can let it, you can let it, you won't die for it. You won't die if you don't celebrate Christmas. You will die if you don't accept. Jesus Christ as your Savior, but the holiday, if you don't celebrate it, it won't kill you. <clears throat> the birth of the Savior was real. It actually happened. It was prophesied in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the New. It is historically accurate, and in my opinion, just the opinion of Brandon, can't back this up with Scripture, it is worthy of celebration and consideration. For if Jesus Christ was not born. We are of all men miserable, should be pitied, because we are doing this in vain. We might as well go cut the grass, shovel the snow, 
whatever it is that you normally do on Sundays. It is utterly ridiculous. If Christ did not come to die for our sins, what we are doing is fruitless, worthless. But we do have hope. Jesus Christ did come. We have hope in Jesus Christ, the righteous. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Daniel, would you pray for us, please? Father God, we thank you and we praise you, Lord, because, because you remind us, Lord, of what you've done for us. You remind us, Lord, that you are God. We are your creation. Uh, Father, I, I thank you for the word that has been spoken. I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the free gift that, that you bring to us. Thank you for making our way to be reconciled with you. We praise you for that. I pray, Lord, as, that as we go uh, our ways, Lord, that we will remember you and we will consider you at all times. Let us worship you, let us glorify you for who you are, for what you have done, Father God. In the holy name of Jesus the Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen.